Ernst Paul Lehman Patent Work presents LGB in America, a video magazine with your host, Hal Clement. It's 11.30 in the morning. We are heading south on Amtrak's train number 76. Greg Louise is at the throttle of the GM F40PH. A railroad link to Los Angeles via San Bernardino, built in 1883, is San Diego's first touch of transportation glory, its first connection to the rest of the country. In 19 Diego is called the Impossible Railroad, tracks clinging to cliffs, burrowing through tunnels, and over the highest wooden trestle in North America. But it isn't until 1988 that San Diego finally gets a railroad link to the world as LGB opens its American headquarters about a mile from the old Santa Fe line. Hi, I'm Hal Clement. You know that LGB has trains, tracks, and operations in over 42 countries around the world. But those operations are coordinated from just two locations, Nuremberg and right here in San Diego. In our video magazine, we're going to take an in-depth look at how this facility can make things better for you and your railroad. We're going to look at some great layouts and take a ride on one of LGB's prototypes through the mountains of Colorado. So let's start our show with the way things start here, with the delivery of a shipment of trains from Germany. It's the end of one long journey, but just the beginning of another. Think of San Diego as a short resting place for the trains on their trip from Germany to your railroad. It's 8 in the morning. This is the first of two container loads arriving today. The next shipment is just two hours out. At this point, the LGB trains have been trucked from Nuremberg to the port of Bremerhaven in Germany. They have crossed the Atlantic, transversed the Panama Canal, sailed the Pacific Ocean up the west coast of North America, been loaded onto a truck in Long Beach, and been driven over 100 miles south to San Diego. They have traveled halfway around the world. Okay, clear. Interesting, you say, but how does having all those trains shipped here and stacked to the ceiling in several warehouses help me run a railroad? You see, we started here uh, six years ago, and we are building up our facility here in order to give the best service to the consumer. Inventory, service. Tony and Rick can tell you about inventory, big inventory, big boxes of big trains. See this layout? Got crates and crates of them right here. We keep the big inventory here in San Diego, and we can ship right away. The orders, of course, come in from dealers. They have to have what you want on hand when you want it. It is not easy. If I look at our range this year, we have 46 different engines, pulling engines, diesel engines, electric engines, steam engines. We have more than 57 passenger cars, different types, different train lines. We have more than 73 freight cars and more than 250 accessories. It's all here. The UPS truck arrives about 10 a.m. Nick is here to receive the trains you are sending back to have repaired. Very few trains come back. That's true, that's true. Um, there's about 0.02% of returns. There's very little to be repaired. That's a good quality test for us. Sounds good, but if your engine is the one in 5,000 that needs attention, you want it done fast. Is the part you need here? It's here, it's here. Inga is in charge of repairs. She thinks there are 2,500 different parts here, several duplicates of each part. We might be talking over a million pieces of inventory in parts alone. With so many parts filling up the building, you'd think they'd want to give them away. They do. 
a letter asking to buy a tender hook. The part goes out, no charge. Had your engine less than five years? Buy it from an authorized dealer? Inga and Brian will fix it free. Free parts. They'll even test it out before sending it back. Inga sometimes gets requests to repair smoke units. She'll fix it for you, no sweat. But if you don't want to be without your engine for a few days, a little later in the program, we'll have Ron Gibson show you the tricks. But let's take a break for a few minutes. The showroom layout is right behind this door. The train is coming, and look at what she's pulling. It's a collector's item now. The Denver and Rio Grande Western car number 3080. It came to our line in 1981, exactly 100 years after they started laying the rails from Durango to Silverton. As we climb aboard the car, you can begin to feel the romance, the history of the glory days of narrow gauge railroading. And as we pull out of the station, it almost seems as if Silverton is just 45 miles up the track. Glaciers carve valleys and streams etched through rock to create some of the most spectacular scenery in the U.S. The Durango and Silverton has become synonymous with narrow gauge railroad. To some, the idea of stringing rails 400 feet above the raging Animas River must have seemed like a nightmare. To General William Jackson Palmer, it was a dream, a challenge. The challenge was met as men hung from ropes blasting out a roadbed in the canyon walls with black powder. It was met with the use of steep grades, met with sharp curves, met with a three-foot gauge track. Cars running here today were built for the Denver and Rio Grande Railway, as are LGBs. They're pulled up from Mile High Durango to Silverton. It's 3,000 feet higher in the San Juan Mountains by more than 100 tons of steam engine and tender. Five steamers still run on the line. In the 1920s, the railroad went the way of the mines. In the 1950s, it was about to be torn up. In 1981, Charles E. Bradshaw, Jr. bought it. Today, you can ride it and travel through scenery that is accessible no other way. The Durango and Silverton runs year-round. Snow is no problem for them. If you want to pull your Denver and Rio Grande Western cars through the snow, this may be the answer. Need something to ride the conductors in comfort? This isn't the end of the line for LGB's Denver and Rio Grande Western series of cars. It's sure not the end of the line for the Durango and Silverton. It's always great to see new products, but there is a reason it seems to take so long. Development of a new engine takes about two or three years and a lot of money to get the molds ready. Over a million dollars for just the mold to make an engine. A mogul has over 600 parts, more than in an average camera. New ideas, new products, new challenges, new, new tests. Right? A track cleaning engine, 2067. A magic marker, its ink is permanent. Well, let's just say its ink was supposed to be permanent. Now, you may have never seen anything like this on a railroad, but there are engines like this, and there are track grinders. But this is unique, created just for LG beer, just like this Denver and Rio Grande engine. It has no prototype, but it is beautiful. It gave birth to the Queen Mary series of engines and cars. It's not uh, exact uh, to the prototype, but people like it, and uh, they wanted it that way, and so we did it. LGB is a railroad for all the people, the people who count rivets, the people who count on good-looking trains, 
the people who count on something new. Next year we will celebrate the 25th anniversary of the train and there will be three new steam engines, lots of cars and action cars too. Speaking of action, how are things going downstairs? <laughs> Looks like Nick is getting ready to pack up the repairs Inga and Brian have finished during the morning. 3181's next. In the warehouse, Tony and Rick are getting an order together for a wholesaler in Wisconsin. Rudy is upstairs in the company's showroom. It's his pet project, a layout with the best of Europe. One side is the European side with the head wire and European scenery. And America. The other one is Western style, the United States with the trestle bridges and all American uh, prototypes, locomotives and cars. Like most things in LGB San Diego headquarters, this layout was built in Nuremberg and transported by container ship. The European section was built in six months by Walter Diller and an assistant. It was followed by the American side. It too took six months. After each of the two main sections was completed, each was disassembled into six subsections and shipped to San Diego. Here they were reassembled. Now we can run 12 trains at the same time, six on each side. And run they do. Eight of the trains are programmed for fully automatic operation. Two trains on each side can be either automated or manually run. While running the trains is automatic, building the layout wasn't. We have about uh, 600 trees of each layout and about uh, 20 switches, roughly 300 feet of tracks. Why did they build the layout? We want to demonstrate the trains, mostly how they run, especially the sound equipment, and then on the European section, we ran it with two sources of electricity, once the pantograph, which is the head wire. They wanted to demonstrate this to dealers, but if you have an LGB gold card, you are welcome to visit most any time. You say you don't have a gold card yet and you're planning a visit to San Diego, give us a call. We'll try to arrange a visit. Meantime, downstairs, Tony and Rick have gotten the order together and the truck is waiting to pick it up. It will be driven to LA, put on another truck, and on its way to Wisconsin by nightfall. Working in the warehouse, Rick sees lots of cars and engines that look the same. He wanted something different. It's his autograph car. Jerry Lewis signed it when he visited. So did Joe Regalbuto. You know him as Frank Fontana, one of the regulars on the Murphy Brown TV show. We know him as Joe Regalbuto, LGBer and railroad empire builder. Joe is no stranger to acting with an Emmy nomination and credits on shows like Magnum P.I., Lou Grant, Night Court, St. Elsewhere, Cagney and Lacey. But when it comes to LGBing, he is a relative newcomer, starting in spring of 91 with this European style layout. His advice to those starting out? There are a couple of publications out now and uh... If you can, uh, there are numbers, uh, you can talk to somebody who's done it. Um, basically, the trains pretty much handle themselves. It's so easy to put the track together and you kind of lay it in the dirt and they'll go. I kid around about it, but I have no skills at all. And I'm not even handy around the house. So, um, so there's a lot of trial and error. And I think, you know, if it were a real railroad, I'd be into millions of dollars of overruns here. But uh, <laughs> you learn from your mistakes and you push on. Working on a garden railroad can be a great stress reliever after long days on the set, but most of the construction here was done during the show's hiatus. Literally one in the morning, sometimes I'd be out there digging. It was my compulsive behavior just, just to want to get it done. No surprise that with that kind of energy, the layout was done in just three months. Now four trains run flawlessly through green, more reminiscent of Switzerland than Santa Monica. I decided at a certain point I didn't want 
any maintenance at all, so I, I put a concrete road bed, which uh, allows me to just hose it off if I want, hose the track. If leaves come on it, I can take a, a blower or a, you know, uh, anything like that. It's just real easy to deal with. Joe's had the Hollywood movers and shakers over for dinner and backyard parties, producers, agents, directors, and stars. Do they want to talk deals, percentages, Nielsen's, or ARB's? No. Joe says the first question is, can we see the trains? 300 feet of track, eight switches, automatic block operation, trains dispatched to here and there, and your railroad background is non-existent. Joe says, be fearless, be a little uh, ignorant. Kind of go out there and say, I can do this. <laughs> and you try it and you have a good time. And um, um, I've tapped skills that I had no idea I had. I mean, I, you know, I'm the maker of mountains now. <laughs> Joe's back on the set at Warner Brothers now, but he will be moving more mountains in the future, no doubt. Now, before we went to talk to Joe, we were talking about collector's cars, and there is one more I'd like to show you. It's in Wolfgang's office, and less than a dozen were made. It's the McDonald's car. It was made to celebrate a grand opening. In Buena Park, it's Big Macs and Big Trains. They go together like Hopes and fries, rails and ties. It's a tourist attraction, Knott's Berry Farm, that draws people from around the world to the park down the street. On their way, they often stop by here. Nicholas is from Australia. Owner Peter Horner might be surprised if the Australians become regulars, but he does have some steady customers from the other side of LA, hours away. First week, he had come with a friend of his, and the second week, he had brought his parents down just to see the, the trains because his dad was a retired engineer from the railroad. Golden arches and wooden trestles. Is it a mix that makes sense? I would estimate that it's probably good for 25 or 30 percent of our sales minimum. That Wolfgang never thought he'd see the day that LGB trains brought customers to McDonald's. We have people that, that have come here from Salt Lake City just to see the train. So who cooked up this combo? Peter had Lionel's as a kid. This gives him the bug. In 1981, he sees his first LGB. It is a freight starter set. He is hooked. Living on a hillside in Santa Ana, Peter can't go outside with his trains. He puts them up and takes them down from time to time. He starts a little collection. As they say in LA, fast forward to 1989. Peter is about to open a new McDonald's and sees his big chance to have his big trains out all the time. I guess this gave me a little bit of an opportunity to, to have a little bit nicer setup and, and have the room to display it. A little chat with partners William and Mark Brownstein and Brian Carmack and the rest is history. Customer reaction has been fabulous. A recipe for success with moguls and mayo, boxcars and burgers, topped off with the sweet sounds of a cash register ringing and the dreams of a young man fulfilled. Making dreams come true. Part magic, part luck, lots of hard work. It's every parent's dream for their children at Christmas. Trains at Christmas, you know the feeling, going to the mall, listening and watching as the engine you want this year pounds on by a snow-covered layout. It's the stuff dreams are made of. Okay, so this monster layout is not going to find its way into your den. Fear not, if you have room for a 48-inch circle of track, you are in business. It helps define the season. Music playing, the sound of trains, kids. A layout will grow with the family, and LGB makes everything you need from the ties up. Some buildings from Pola and trees from the Christmas store, and you can get close to the look of that layout on the mall. LGB is rugged, it sets up quickly, and it's easy to put away. You say you don't want to put it away? 
Carl Fetzen got a present from his wife. He didn't want to put it away either. Let's check it out. It was a typical house on a quiet street until Carl Fetzing got the LGB fever. I started about uh, five years ago when my wife first got the engine and the two cars. I think when I got him the initial set, I had no clue that it was going to come to this. But I knew he got real serious when he cut a hole through the house. I can run him out of the garage with this homemade transformer here. When the train leaves the garage, it comes in through here along the back of the wall, through the bedroom, out to the backyard. Pretty fancy way to get the rolling stock rolling outside. Now tell me again how this got started. Well, it started out just with one loop around the backyard, and my wife came up with the idea she wanted a town, thought it'd be cute. And so I just started to build a town. I uh, kept on digging out more of the backyard and <laughs> kind of flipped out, I guess. Carl found that flipping out with LGB fever is easily cured with doses of moderation. That's what's great about this hobby is that you can just do a little at a time. You get tired, you can do something else and go back to it. Fran Fetzing found that LGB fever stimulated her creativity. I think that we both tend to be on a creative side, and we both sort of took off with what we like. For me, it's like playing dolls again. I, I love it. I love the miniature aspect of it. If you look over toward the church, you see the little wedding there. That's really what I love to do. That's Aunt Millie's farmhouse, and so... If, if you think back to the least I do in my childhood, I had an aunt who lived out in the farm, and I try to think, okay, what goes out, what goes out on a farm? Well, it doesn't have to be the best house in the world, and in fact, Aunt Millie's is supposed to fall down over there, but it's still, it's functional, and it's homey. Fran will tell you, the trains aren't just for men. When my uh, brother and I were growing up, we had trains along with my dad, and we'd go down the basement all the time and play trains. Carl is in charge of the rolling stock. 25 to 30 engines, 150 cars. Sound like a collector? Not at all. If I buy it, I want to run it. That's why I bought it. I bought it to run it. I'm not want to sit in the box and collect dust in the garage or something. Fran is the superintendent of green. She tries to save it, the stuff with George Washington's picture on it, and keep the rest of the green looking lush. I went to the library and started reading up on bonsai. If you go out and buy bonsais that are this size, they're a small fortune. So what I learned is that you can take any plant, keep it small. I keep it in the, I keep, I plant most of them in the pots that keeps their roots all compact and just keep, keep them chopped down at the top and they stay small. For the Fetzings, the hobby is more than the hardware. Our children are all growing and gone from the house and I think a lot of people our age I have an empty nest syndrome. We went the opposite way. We adopted trains. And like any proud parents, they like to show off their family to visitors. Carl and Fran hold several open houses each year. What do they get out of all this? Fun, mostly. Fun and friendship. Fun, friendship, and family. The ultimate result of a severe attack of LGB fever. Just ask the Fetzings. Or just ask Wolfgang. You'd be surprised. With a whole building full of trains to sell, the last thing you would expect him to say is... Start small, start slowly. Just let one engine run around a circle, add some cars. Slowly, moderately. Two good watchwords for people in the hobby. They don't cut it when a customer is waiting to get his trains back into operation. With this in mind, Nick is rushing to get the outgoing shipment to the UPS man. They are loaded and on their way home. Like all of the inventory here in San Diego, from new trains to parts, the repair jobs are tracked by Lars and the crew in LGB's computer center. Computer programmers, repair specialists, layout designers, the building's full of them. But the hobby's for just folks, too. Earlier, you heard Joe Regalbudo say that he had no hobby skills when he started out. Inga learned train repair on this little 2020 steamer here. 
and now it's your turn to learn. Smoke units do burn out from time to time. Now, Inga will fix it. You can just ship it in. But Ron Gibson can save you that trip to the post office. First thing to do is you'll determine that the smoke unit is bad is to take both a small pair of either dikes or needle nose pliers, reach in, grab the smoke element very carefully, and pull up. You can reach up, pull the element out just till like, the wires get taunt. Snip the wires with just a little bit left there, and if you lean it over like this, make sure they don't trace back inside. The replacement smoke unit is a 2085 slash 3. The smoke unit itself basically slips back into the hole by splicing the wires together and insulating them so that they don't uh, short out. I always leave, oh, about three inches of wire on here. Simply take, strip the wires back. It can be used done with diagonal pliers or with wire strippers that are available at any electronics hardware type store. Okay, you've got your wires apart. Proper soldering techniques tell us to tin your wires. By tinning your wires, what we mean is to take and put a little bit of solder on the wires so that when we attach the other wires to them, the, the wires attach very easily. Make sure your tip of your iron is clean. Proper technique is to heat the wire and then add the solder. Okay, now matching black to black and white to white, which isn't super critical, but good practices tell us to do it this way. Heating the two wires together, tug on them to make sure that, see they don't really take much solder once they're, they're tinned and put together like that. I always tug on them to make sure that they're not going to come apart, because if they're going to come apart, they're going to come apart just after you put the locomotive together and wrap up the job, so it's good to test. We recommend... R5001 smoke hood. Reason being is, is that uh, if you use a lamp oil or something that's made to catch fire, uh, the smoke element gets hot, it gets low, the, the lamp oil catches fire, and if there's anything, the, the train's going underneath a Christmas tree or under uh, anything that could be flammable by a little bit of flame, it's, it's best to use the smoke hood that's, man, that's made by the manufacturer. Now, I'm, what I'm using here is black electrical tape. There's all kinds of tapes that you can use. You can use heat shrink tubing, which is common in most electronic stores. Now, just a matter of pushing the wires and everything back down in the stack, which by grabbing here, I'm pushing short amounts in because the wire is pretty flexible. And just to press back in, Carefully across the top, you can just take and push it so it's level. And she's repaired. The real test is put a little fluid in. And make sure the switch on the back of the cab is set to the center position, which gives you light and smoke. And make contact with the set of the wheels here. In a secret LGB laboratory, cleverly disguised to look like his mother's kitchen, Jared Etzel is testing the durability of an LGB engine. About three feet, 41. This looks good. So. All right. Mm. Brand new. Mm. Kids, don't try this at home. I'm a professional. Boy, are you in big trouble? 
Oh, no. no problem, that's LGB. Good as new. Jared used an aquarium full of goldfish for this test, but even if you have piranhas, your LGB engine is guaranteed for a full five years when you buy from an authorized LGB retailer. Jared thinks you'll never need that guarantee. With a commercial out of the way and the heavy work almost done inside, it's time to have a little fun. That's what thousands of San Diegans do every year at the Del Mar Fair, and for the past several years, LGB has been there. A garden railway really requires two things. That's right, a garden and a railway. Well, here they both are. The idea was to make it a natural setting, not see how many flowers you can plant, but make it look like the kind of landscape a train might really run through. Let's take a ride. This isn't the kind of display that springs up overnight. The Garden Railway Society members worked for five weeks to get it like this. The trains, the track, the plants, the rocks, some of them weighing 5,000 pounds, all done just for the Del Mar Fair. Exactly, we did. We brought it all in just for this exhibit, and it'll all go out after the fair. This rock, by the way, comes from Colorado, so it came from Colorado to San Marcos and then down to the fair. It's the kind of thing that must intrigue a lot of people because they show up in great numbers to watch. <coughs> Young and old alike, generations sharing the sight of trains moving through rocks and foliage. They just don't have a lumber train here. Yes, they do. Look, see? Yeah. One of the appeals of the Garden Railway is that it gets a lot of people involved. For people who love working with trains, there are obviously plenty of trains. And for people who love gardening, there's a lot of gardening to do. It's something a lot of couples are getting involved with. Husband and wife do their own thing, but toward a common goal. When the men had the trains in the attic and the basement, it was the men's game. But once it came out into the garden, we got involved, because the garden's mostly our territory. People will watch this train wind its way through its downsized forest through Sunday. Then, of course, when the fair ends, this exhibit will end, too. It will exist only in memory and in pictures and videotape. You know, you start getting attached to it, and everybody says, surely you're going to leave this up you know, forever. And uh, no, I think we'll uh, take it down and divvy the rocks up, and what we'll probably do next time is have an entirely different design concept next year, and it'll be fun all over again. There is always next year, but it's going to be difficult to top this year. This is quite a ride. The San Diego Garden Railroad Club's exhibit at the fair has been in the flower pavilion with all the greenery. Up north in Fontana, Ted and Charlie Greeno took the green out of their greenhouse. It looks like a scene from the Adams Family. But it's a scene from the Greeno Greenhouse. Where once there were exotic flowers growing, now there are G-scale trains in exotic settings. Ted and Charlie Greeno like trains, but they like them better when they frame a little bit of yesteryear. The church and the Indian village, almost any of them take attention away from just the general thing of walking to a train layout. Light is her life. Charlie Greeno designs lights, special lights. Lights for the homes of Lionel Richie, Penny Rogers, and the late Michael Landon. Ted, who is the light of her life, works with her doing the engineering and fabrication. The job keeps them together, so does the hobby. With so many families torn apart, I think it's a plus, a, a real plus, that you enjoy things together. It's not the little gauges that, like HO and N gauge and such where the man is off in the basement or in the attic all by himself. Uh, it's involving the whole family and that's why it's really, I think it's a fantastic Oh, I do too. I love it.
big cities, the American frontier. Kind of surprising to hear that Ted's first purchase was the 2301 European starter set. Ted collected the European style until three years ago when he went wild about the West. Now that he has found his niche, his time and place, so to speak, Ted is working down to the details, to automation, to details like a cave formed from amethyst geodes, to automation that protects the life of a railroad worker as he crosses the main line from a crystal cave. Kind of appropriate that this railroad is here in a greenhouse. It's a moving, natural, almost living labor of love, as exotic as any flower that called this place home. It's our joy. It's our hobby, it's our joy, and we love it. the world to out of this world. Out of this world certainly describes the layout of Roger Clarkson in Riverside, California. Roger Clarkson has a big layout. How big, you ask? It's so large, Roger keeps an eye on his trains with a remote video camera. so big that the monitors and control panel are in an air-conditioned gazebo. It's so large that Roger has about four-tenths of a mile of track in a double main line. There is a huge, covered, lockable train storage yard. Still not impressed? Roger runs trains that could stock a small hobby shop. Oh, I love to run 25, 30 uh, car trains. Uh, I like to see those trains uh, when they pull up that grade over that 1% grade we have up there, especially those mallies when they're, you see that smoke coming out and all those wheels and mechanisms working. It's an amazing uh, piece of engineering. Yeah, what's special about it, it looks real on a railroad this size. It really does look real. Realism. To achieve it, Roger worked from 7 a.m. to dark when he started his layout in October of 88. He moved 188 cubic yards of topsoil. But a big railroad doesn't mean big problems. I don't think people should be intimidated. All it really is, this railroad is a bunch of, uh, what I'd say, just small railroads put together, you know. That's what it really is. It's just one block of power hooked to another block of power. Roger says he recommends sticking to the basics. You want to do good track work. You want to make sure you have continuity in your tracks. You want to make sure that, you, uh, that the electricity is always flowing through those tracks properly by putting jumper wires around it. You want a good base, a good base of uh, gravel for drainage and so on. Roger came to LGB after a love affair with HO. The only time I ever seen any LGB was at a train store, and as I said, I was in another gauge at that time, and I thought it was for, you know, children, uh, LGB. But really, I did not realize how prototypical an LGB train could be. And when I saw it running, it was just absolutely uh, gave me shivers down my spine. Roger's wife, Faith, has been an equal partner in the railroad. Faith has done everything from planning and planting to track work. By now, you may be saying, yeah, it looks like you're right. It's a big layout. But in case you're still not convinced, consider. 
It takes 17 amps of power just to run the city. The city is served by mass transit and its own airport. When the circus comes to the city, it sets up on its own island in the town lake where Roger can run radio controlled boats. Roger's heart is as big as his railroad. He throws parties for underprivileged kids, opens his house to the elderly from nearby nursing homes. He holds clinics for those who ask. Now, all things considered, are you surprised that this is known by his pals as Clarkson Railroad Park? Hello, I'm Margaret Radford. This is an LGB car. Its scale is 1 to 22.5. This is also an LGB car. Its scale is 1 to 1. This car runs on LGB track. So does this one. It's getting late, way past midnight in Germany. Nuremberg has been closed for hours. Upstairs, Wolfgang and Wilfred are planning tomorrow's operations. Elsa is closing out the books for the day. Downstairs, it's quiet in the warehouse. The orders have all been filled. A huge operation spanning the globe, a, a worldwide love affair with trains, with especially strong feelings of affection here in America. Why? Well, my friend Larry Himmel has some thoughts on that. I took my first ride on a train at a kiddie land on Chicago's south side. And even if it did just loop in a lazy circle around the amusement park, one ride and I was hooked. The horn sounded, the lights flashed, the gates went down, it was magic. When I was 10, my parents took me on the Broadway Limited to New York City. On the Broadway Limited TV next Monday, a bedroom. The short-coated porters, the white linen dining car, the bunk bedded sleepers are indelible marks on my memory. <sighs> During summers in high school and college, I worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad in the hump yard. There I met hobos. They weren't men of economic misfortune. They were mythical riders of the rails. And every Christmas, we put up the train. Nothing fancy, just lazy circles around the tree like the Kitty Land train. But the horn sounded, the lights flashed, and the gate went down. It was magic. I'll never forget the smell of the burning transformer. It always renewed my love of trains. Now I have a child of my own. He's not even four months old, but I bought him his first train. Nothing fancy, just long, slow loops. I want him to know trains their grace, their majesty, their place in American history. I want him to feel the magic. Look at it. Go. Look at that train go. You see Santa? You see Santa? Know the magic. That's what it's all about. Magic that is worldwide, magic that's unique to each person. Here at LGB, what we try to do every day is capture just a little bit of that magic, put it in a box, and send it your way. For you, for your children, for your family. I'm Hal Clement.
Isn't that great? Hi, I'm Mark Horowitz. Garden railroading is the fastest growing segment of the model train hobby today. In our video album, we'll show you garden railroads from around the country and give you an idea of how other people have approached the hobby. Garden railroading was not always as it is today. Let's take a quick look at how the hobby evolved. Garden railroading has a long, rich history. In fact, the hobby was already more than half a century old when this film was shot in the 1930s. In 1860, the model train hobby was in its infancy, as was the full-size railroad industry. The development of model railroads closely paralleled that of full-size railroads, and railroad builders often built models to test their theories and to present their ideas. The concept of a fully working model railroad was soon exploited. The first primitive models were made by craftsmen for themselves or for wealthy clients. These were most often powered by steam and were fairly large in scale, which necessitated their use outdoors. It wasn't long, however, before manufacturers got the notion that there might be a few dollars in model and toy trains. Toy train makers sprouted like weeds, primarily in Germany and Great Britain. There was no continuity when it came to the scale of the trains or the gauge of the track. That meant that if I wanted to run my trains on your track, chances were pretty slim that we could do it because of the disparity in the equipment. In the late 1880s, the famous Markland Company of Nuremberg came up with standardized gauges and scales. Their first three offerings were imaginatively named Gauge 1, Gauge 2, and Gauge 3. Gauge 1, at 45 millimeters, or around 1 and 3 quarter inches, was the smallest. These standards were soon adopted by virtually all European and some American model train manufacturers. By today's standards, even the small gauge one was still pretty large, and relatively few people had enough space indoors to build a model railroad, so they built them outdoors. The more sophisticated builders molded the terrain through which their trains ran and added suitable plantings to enhance their lines. It might be a good idea to examine the term garden railway. In Britain, where garden railroading was born and achieved its pinnacle, the yard outside one's house was called the garden. It didn't really matter if there was anything planted there or not, it was still the garden. Thus, a garden railway was any railroad built outdoors in the yard. It wasn't until years later that gardening per se was formally associated with garden railroading. Several large railways sprang up on British estates and smaller ones were created in more modest settings. Beautiful garden lines were built in Gage O as well, and children often brought their Hornby or Bassett Lope trains outdoors to build railways that varied in permanence. In the United States, though, things were different. Gage One never had a great following here. The Lionel Company, followed by American Flyer and others, developed their own large gauge, which they called Standard Gauge. Virtually all of their literature promoted the use of these trains indoors. Lionel was such a formidable force in the industry that they as much as dictated how the trains were to be used. Garden railroading had little chance. During the 20s and 30s, the American Flyer Company of Chicago did do a little advertising showing their products in use outdoors. And of course there was the famous Buddy L non-powered railway system designed expressly for outdoor use. An example of Buddy L in the garden was Dick Cooper's extensive line built in the 1930s. Mr. Cooper electrified the non-powered engines and used Buddy L components as a basis for kit bashing and scratch building. Unfortunately though, the Buddy L system was large and expensive and it saw relatively small acceptance despite the ruggedness and beauty of the trains. Garden railroads were sometimes featured in U.S. railroad and model railroad publications during the first half of the century, though the presentation of them was often more as a novelty than anything else. On the other hand, in Britain and in other parts of the world, garden railways were much more a part of the mainstream pastime of model railroading, and they were prominently featured in the industry press. The near total demise of garden railways was brought on by the Second War. After World War II, life as was known before was gone forever. Gauge 1 became obsolete, and gauges 2 and 3 had long since died out. New smaller scales that allowed much more railroad to be built in a given space, usually indoors, were becoming popular. So by 1950, garden railways were in decline. It's ironic that the first, and quite possibly still the best, real treatise on garden railroading was published during the twilight of interest. Englishman R.E. Tustin's book, Garden Railways, 
published in 1949, remains probably the single best source of information on the nuts and bolts end of this arcane pursuit. It's also the first book that set down in writing the principles of combining the railway with an appropriately scaled garden. In the States, garden railways were almost unheard of throughout the 1950s and 60s. But in 1969, the German company of Ernst Paul Lehmann, toy makers from way back, introduced a new old concept in model trains. Their all-plastic LGB trains were initially models of narrow-gauge trains from Germany. They were built to the scale of 1 to 22.5, and they ran on the old standardized gauge 1 track. LGB trains were specifically designed for use outdoors. LGB's product line constituted a revolution in model railroading, but one that did not succeed overnight. The trains were looked upon as toys by most serious modelers in the U.S. But Lehman persevered, and the company continued to come out with new products based on railroads from around the world, including America. By the mid-1970s, the flame of interest had been kindled. LGB has prospered, and today there are several large American companies making trains for use in the garden following LGB's precept. To complement these large manufacturers, dozens of small companies and cottage industries are putting out related products that keep modelers happy and the industry humming. Garden railroaders today practice their art in all seasons of the year and in all climates. Bad weather is no obstacle, and it's not uncommon to see trains running in the rain or locomotives plowing the snow from the rails in the dead of winter. All sorts of motive power are in use today, from track-powered electric engines to battery-powered radio-controlled engines to engines running on real steam. Structures and rolling stock can be anything from an off-the-shelf plastic kit to things that took hundreds of hours to scrap build. Though garden railroading today is much different from what it was a hundred years ago, its roots can be easily traced and the influence of the past masters can be clearly seen in today's more sophisticated lines. While looking through this video album, we'll see some examples of how today's garden railroaders are approaching the hobby. Bridges and trestles are one of the most popular aspects of garden railroading. They serve a variety of functions and can add drama to the scene. They can span a gap, they can keep the track level as the ground falls away, they can visually tie two parts of the railway together. Bridges and trestles can be built from a variety of different materials, including wood, metal and concrete.
Whether it's a still pond or a fast flowing creek, water can add another dimension to the garden railway. A quiet pond can create a reflective mood and the sound of falling water is quite soothing. Water also offers the opportunity for a different kind of gardening. Flowing water is something in the garden that moves in addition to the train and helps bring the entire scene to life. Tunnels can be important focal points on the Garden Railway, and they can serve a variety of uses. They can fulfill the obvious purpose of taking the track through a bump in the ground, they can add mystery and drama, and they can help create the illusion of distance as the train disappears and reappears someplace else. A tunnel portal can be a formal structure made of brick or concrete, or it can be a much more informal structure made of wood or even logs. Landscaping, including rocks and stonework, bring the railway to life and give it purpose. Most effective garden railways are the ones that are thoughtfully integrated into the garden. In fact, railway gardening has become a sub-hobby rooted in the traditions of rock and alpine gardening. There are three levels of planting, generally, with the garden railway. Close to the track, use small-scale plants that look right with the trains. Mid-range, larger plants can be used and in the background, very tall plants can be used to form a backdrop. The use of rocks should suggest a natural outcropping. If you have an uninteresting yard, it can be transformed by bringing in rocks and soil to break up the flatness.
Structures and miniatures bring the human element to the railway. Through them you can create an ideal world. By using a few well-chosen and carefully placed structures, you can suggest an entire town. And the intelligent use of a few miniatures can suggest human occupation even without the use of figures. In addition to offering great solitary pleasure, the Garden Railway can be a wonderful gathering place for family and friends. It can be a place where ideas are shared, creativity is sparked, 
and enthusiasm is inspired. And also, getting ready for an open day is one of the best incentives that I can think of to getting your garden railway in shape. Now that we've seen some garden railways and seen some of the features that make them what they are, let's take a ride on some and look at them up close.
I hope you've enjoyed our video album of Garden Railways and have picked up a few ideas to try out on your own lines. In closing, I'd like very much to thank those people who have shared their Garden Railroads with us.